This is A Confused Heap of Facts, the podcast where we have a discussion about history with the faculty of the Department of Military History in the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College. The views expressed in this podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the Department of the Army, Department of Defense, or U.S. Government. Dr. Jonathan Abel, and I'm here with Dr. Bill Nance. Hello. And today we're talking to Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Nate Jennings from the JMO Department here at CGSC. Great to be with you guys again. And one of the many things that uh, Colonel Jennings uh, researches and, and presents on is one of the more fascinating figures in early American military history, a uh, general named Winfield Scott, who, uh, who I would argue is one of the seminal figures of the period, but often gets lost in the, the kind of the Grants and Shermans and, and Washingtons of early America. Uh, so we'll, we'll kind of start with just a, a brief um, overview. What's your, what's your one sentence on, on why Winfield Scott matters to the U.S. Army? Uh, most effective commanding general in the U.S. Army's history. Okay, that is a good hook. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, who is Winfield Scott? Where does he come from? So Winfield Scott is a Virginian. Comes from a scion of a, he's a scion of the Revolutionary War. His dad's in the Continental Army, um, and he attends William and Mary. And he ends up being quite an action hero in the War of eighteen twelve, where he leads from the front. He's wounded, rapidly promoted. He has horses shot out from under him, uh, and then he'll go on to be, I would say, the most influential. Uh, army officer on the the shaping of the army as an institution prior to the Civil War. We could probably bring George Washington into that as well, but he's in uniform for 53 years, Mm -hmm. uh, continuous. Uh, He's the commander of the entire army for 20 of those years, from 1841 to 61. Uh, So as a fun exercise, I was trying to think under our current pension system, what would his pension be? (laughs) And I think he'd, he'd be at something like 128% 128% of his base pay. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, he would collect the rest of his life um, yeah. based off that service. So, and just for comparison, since uh, Colonel Jennings, you were in uniform, Dr. Nance, you have been in uniform. Uh, is this normal for somebody to be in uniform for this long? Is this abnormal? What's what's the difference? No, it's uh, the, now we've since changed the retirement system uh, just in the past 10 years or so. But tip, a, a, a standard career is typically seen as anywhere from about 20 to 30 years. You have those abnormal cases or some general officers, some really old warrant officer five, who is maybe up into the 35 category. But there's actually a max age you can be and a max amount of service you can cover. And 50 years is unheard of. So other than infirmities of age... Why would you not necessarily want an officer who has that much experience? It seems like you might make an argument that's a good thing. Well, I'll, I'll take the World War II argument, and then I'll pitch it over to Colonel Jennings here. But in World War II, we actually had the case of we had several guys that were in their six, in their late 50s and 60s. And the argument was is they did not have the physical vigor in order to uh, be in, uh, to, to sustain the, uh, the, the challenges of combat. Uh, because combat, okay, so okay, you have these these are generals. They're not running around taking hills. Hopefully, <laughs> right? Uh, if they are, something's going wrong. But but Scott does lead yeah. the invasion of Mexico yeah. on horseback, right? So so, uh, so there's so there's some challenges there, and a lot of what it comes out to is is that the other reason is is that in some cases you have people that are so set in their ways and so used to how we have always done them that sometimes that can get in the way of newer and cr- more creative thinking as it comes through. Not in every case, but in World War II, as a, for instance, we get, we push through it and go from there. You also have the a last reason, and I'll, call, I'll just say the MacArthur reason. You have somebody that's in, that's in, politi- that's in military uniform for so long that they start to view the military as their own personal They become fiefdom. the institution. Right. Sir. Yeah, uh, one example from Scott's time in the uh, 
early 1840s, the U.S. Army is looking to modernize its artillery arm, and the veteran generals of the War of 1812 want iron cannon. Mm -hmm. They're wedded to it, and it takes some innovative uh, fact-finding tours to Europe, some new officers, uh, and uh, a secretary of war who's uh, looking for new ideas to realize, no, they need bronze cannon. Mm -hmm. And so they go a, a different direction. By the way, we've seen several times in American history where war starts, the Department of War Defense realizes the, the current general officer corps is not going to cut it. They di divest a bunch of the older guys and bring in new blood. That's how Eisenhower vaults so many ranks in just a couple of years. Right. Um, and so not saying that uh, age necess means necessarily you'll be inflexible, but right. sometimes new ideas come with new people. Well, so let's then discuss why it is that Scott is around for so long. When you run into a general officer today who's been in for, you know, 34 years or whatever, uh, when you run into a Winfield Scott in history who is in charge for so long, what kind of individual is that person? The person who's managed to stay around for so long and adapt to new ideas? Well, he's adept at political maneuvering, for one. He has allies in the Congress. So even when there's presidents of an opposing party, he's a Whig, Democrats run the table for a while. Um, he's able to rely on allies in Congress to preserve him uh, mm -hmm. and to advance him. So, for example, in 1847, President Polk wants to send a Democrat to lead the invasion of Mexico. He tries to anoint uh, a Missouri senator, actually, Senator Benton. Um, and Scott gets his allies in Congress to sink that idea, going back to the default, who's the ready, able commander sitting in D.C., uh, managing kind of the, the enterprise, it's Scott. And so he, by default, he gets uh, what will be the most consequential command of the war. Okay. So let's talk at least briefly. We've done other podcast episodes on the period, but let's, let's talk at least briefly about the U.S. Army before the Mexican War. What kind of organization is it? Where are its officers from? And what does it do when it's not fighting either the War of 1812 or the Mexican War? Well, it's a very small army, uh, mostly constabular army, uh, dispersed for frontier operations. Some uh, engagement in, in Indian wars, the Seminole Wars will in Florida will occupy it. Uh, you have the Black Hawk War in the north. Um, but really, um, the first time between 1812 uh, in 1846, you, you'll go that that long of a gap be, without doing consolidated maneuvers. Mm -hmm. So when General Taylor gathers the army at Corpus Christi and starts drilling them, they really are doing the first consolidated regimental and above maneuvers, learning that ascent, those essential tasks, that coordination uh, with the artillery and the infantry and the cavalry. So it's a, it's a constabulary army. Um, you asked about the composition, the officer corps, mostly from well-to-do families in the East Coast. Mm -hmm. uh, the enlisted corps, a lot of immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's very famous to have enlisted soldiers that can't speak English. In so the this army. is kind of the, the two hots in the cot army? Yes. So it, what you're saying is that this is not a professional army, or is it? Uh, in, in some ways it is. I mean, the uh, not to the, to the degree that we would think of it, um, much more personality dependent, which is, I guess, the opposite of professionalism. Uh, but as West Point has established, it's going to start the, the trends in that direction. Okay, so are these long service recruits and long service officers, or is there a lot of churn? Uh, definitely a longer service amongst many of the officers. Um, and by the way, re promotion is hard to come by. Small army, you move up when someone moves out. Um, by the way, similar to many of our National Guard uh, state promotion systems basically work that way now. Um, and so you'll have officers spend decades uh, even at the same rank, mm -hmm. um, and then all of a sudden there's a war, an expansion, and they vault up to being a general officer. Um, this happens you know, to Scott in 1812. He goes from basically being, a, I think, a regimental commander to a one-star general mm -hmm. almost overnight. Mm -hmm. So for a question for both of you. Um, what are the challenges and what are the advantages of a, a kind of a part-time constabulary army? Uh, well, uh, the advantage is um, low-level low leadership. So you, you, it's very common to have companies, maybe even platoons, similar to the counterinsurgency posture we had during Operation Iraqi Freedom. 
Uh, they're dispersed all over the country, so lieutenants and captains are making decisions, uh, uh, literally decisions of life and death. They're interfacing with the populace, with Indian tribes. They're on the border uh, with Mexico. They're uh, dealing with tensions with Great Britain. And so that's, that's definitely an advantage. You have an empowered uh, junior officer corps, and that shows itself in Mexico. Mm-hmm. Uh, when they, they lead with initiative, aggression, uh, throughout the campaign. That's one of, I would consider, the advantages the U.S. Army has over uh, the junior officers of the Mexican Army. Um, disadvantage, when it's time to do large-scale combat, inexperienced. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a different kind of skill set uh, to, to mass forces to move under fire like that against a peer adversary. Um, and they have to, you know, and there's some setbacks in 1812, mm-hmm. right? In that war, 12, 13, 14, um, where the, the weaknesses of the, the American army are shown. And then in Mexico, they go a different direction. Yeah, in 1812, just so so listeners understand, 1812, arguably the most incompetent war the U.S. Army ever fought, in large part because of these issues. Basically, the only major battle the U.S. Army won was Andrew Jackson's uh, hodgepodge at New Orleans. Well, thanks to the pirates. Right, uh, right. Jean pirates of the Caribbean Donahue. helped out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> as you take a look at it, the other disadvantage that comes with this is that you, uh, Colonel Jennings talked about all the... the tactical and operational challenges, but also the strategic and uh, infrastructural challenges, right? A large army requires a different infrastructure than a small army. Mm-hmm. It kind of goes without saying, but uh, the details sort of matter. We were talking before the po- before we started talking about the podcast about Marat with his 30,000 ca- heavy cavalry charging on the second day of Gettysburg as a, as a kind of a joke. But the idea being is you don't suddenly have 30,000 well-trained Horsemen, yeah. horses, the equipment to go with it, uh, that, requires an indu- yeah. the, uh, the, that requires an industrial base, that requires uh, the stud farms, it requires all, all this infrastructure that mm-hmm. simply doesn't exist. So if you want to stand up 10,000 new infantrymen, you have to give those guys rifles. At, and as well, worth pointing out, this is a period of American history where the federal government is considered to be... Um, an impediment to American life in a lot of ways, particularly by the Jacksonian Democrats. Uh, so the government does not want to spend money on things mm-hmm. like this, and it it understands the need for a military. But it, you know, if the states can defray that cost, uh, human and material, I think I think the federal government would prefer it that way. So it's it's a very different America. It's a pre income tax America. And there's actually kind of a school of thought, maybe the the Cincinnati school of thought that. The the militia man who takes up arms for his own homestead and territory will fight harder right. uh, than an expensive regular army that that may may become authoritarian at some point. Right. Yeah, and that's the big fear in early America too that a large army would become authoritarian because they all read yeah. about the history of Rome. And of course, Rome was overthrown by a military dictator. Right. No, so good. Uh, you mentioned uh, if we kind of drill down on Scott's uh, interwar years career. You mentioned the importance of standing up West Point, which kind of, you know, it opens in, what, 1802, but it takes a, it takes about a decade to really get rolling. The first graduating class was two cadets. Yeah, exactly. So during this downtime, uh, professional military education, the officer corps, being shaped into a professional force. What's involved in that, and what role does Scott play in it? Uh, so a lot of it's just standardization of the cadet training program instead of you know, they're coming from all walks of life, life prior to West Point. Now I'm going to funnel the officers through uh, this one training ground, give them an education. It's really important for the modernization of the engineer and artillery branches, which have a, a big role on the East Coast and with fortifications and naval ba- or uh, coastal batteries. Mm-hmm. Um, but definitely the standardization, the professionalization, the identity of the Army, really West Point becomes the heart of that Kind of, kind of the identity. All the senior officers will pass through occasionally. Mm-hmm. It's very important to Scott, um, and this is going to be shown in Mexico, where uh, you know I would I point out two branches. One, well, really three. Uh, the engineers are instrumental in the reconnaissance. So guys like uh, Bobby Lee, Beauregard, McClellan, like they're they do very well as uh, to guide the army, mm-hmm. and Scott relies on them. On it. They're they're put on his personal staff. Second, the artillerymen do very well. You have some West Point trained uh, uh, field artillery officers that 
literally save the day in in a few battles. And then finally, we have the great examples of the infantrymen. Um, we have you know Longstreet, Grant, those guys going over the wall, Pickett, um, in the various fortifications they have to take surrounding Mexico City. So. Uh, a lot of initiative, a lot of aggression, mm-hmm. uh, and able kind of leadership from the front from mm-hmm. these West Point officers. I think also when Scott, guys like Scott are laying out the battle plan, uh, which is often maneuver based or siege based, designed to avoid excessive uh, casualties, I think they get what he's doing. Like mm-hmm. they, they're school trained, they've read Jomini, they know exactly what the line of communication from. Mexico City to Veracruz means how important it is. So when he puts some of these officers in charge of a what we would call an intermediate staging base, Puebla, halfway, they know they have to hold it. They know what kind of the science of war at play is. And that's something I wanted to highlight is some a lot of those things you mentioned were technical skills. Yes. Mm-hmm. So uh, how do those technical skills play into the American Army's success? Because shockingly, for such a small and experienced force, we don't do too bad. Yeah, and this could, you know, we'll talk about this with Veracruz, bringing, uh, you know, the, the scientific process of a siege, and they execute it well. Uh, yeah. They surround the city. They have to dig in the guns. Uh, they have engineers designing fortified gun batteries to protect the, the, the gunnery crews. Mm-hmm. Robert E. Lee is going to famously design and be in charge of one of these um, that, that is instrumental. Um, so this, is, this, this education is very important, and, and it's going to validate West Point. Well, as a worthy think, investment. I think something worth pointing out here. Uh, one, we do have a prior episode on the French influence on the early American army with uh, Dr. Michael Bonero, which is which feeds into a lot of this. But two, again, both of you have been in uniform. Colonel Jennings, you still are. So what we're talking about here is the difference between the art and the science of warfare. Yeah. West Point is still today a scientific institution. It only grants bachelors of science, right? With my Bachelor of Science in History, right. yes. It's the only one that exists. <laughs> um, so obviously we understand the technical needs of an engineer, an artillerist, somebody involved in building, whether it's coastal batteries or these kind of ad hoc battlefield emplacements. Um, but what it sounds like to me is that we've described an army of technocrats. And if they don't have the time or money to practice the art part, how do you keep that? Before we talk about the Mexican War, we'll get into those details in a bit. But how do you maintain that in an army where you where you can't really practice the art, where really all you have is the science? Well, it depends on what art they're practicing. It's an active army. It's forward deployed for, all, you know, between 1812 to 1846, it's distributed across the entire country, sometimes doing combat operations, sometimes not. Um, and again, so they're practicing, they're doing patrolling, they're doing long distance movements, uh, a lot of dispersed logistics, mm-hmm. some, something we might call contested logistics with various uh, tribal and uh, you know, brigands out there robbing stagecoaches and supply trains. So they're, they're, they're dealing with all of this. It's just a different kind of art. So let's say um, Captain Nance, <laughs> you, have your, uh, you have your unit, you know, it's, let's say 200 people, and you're stationed in a frontier fort, and you know you have these missions. How do you maintain the fighting edge that you know needs to be used in what we would now call large-scale combat operations, big battles? Well, some of what it is is you're not. Uh, is you're not maintaining the, dr- the drill that works with that. But what you are doing in some cases is, it, and that's because you don't have a whole regiment or something along the sides, but part of the drill of that era is, is that you're going to fight the say that the company level or the battalion level. You're going to fight about the same way. You just don't have other companies and battalions to your left and right. As Joe Money says, a regiment should always fight the same way. Right. So at that point, as so long as you are enforcing standards and discipline to mm-hmm. fight your company, you understand if you're reading your books. Which this is the other interesting thing that I think Colonel uh, was hitting on a little bit is is that the United States Army. Overall, and you can contest this, but I think they did a reasonably decent job at in bringing in intellectually curious or at least thinking officers, mm-hmm. where they uh, where they spent the time in. Okay, I only have this one company in front of me, but I can use my imagination to see what does this look like, or what would this look like if I had a regiment, a couple regiments. 
uh, you know, uh, on the battlefield. So that's kind of the same piece, which is, interestingly enough, in uh, this era, you could argue that a company really does fight like a regiment, just smaller. Uh, and the other piece is you have the intellectually curious officer who is sitting there reading these books. I mean, uh, to put a plug in for our own discipline, this is where the study of military history helps. And you, mm-hmm. and these guys are reading military history. They're reading the campaigns of Napoleon. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that helps. They absolutely are reading those yeah. those uh, initial studies on the Napoleonic Wars. There's a Napoleon club at West Point. Yep. Um, Scott goes to Europe right after, in fact, he's a little annoyed he gets there shortly after Waterloo, and he's actually meeting the greats, mm-hmm. um, and so he's bringing that back. Other officers go go to Europe. It's quite normal. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, how much is a lieutenant on a frontier fort getting that? I don't know that we know that, but it's getting they're getting some of it at least. Okay. So let's, let's speed forward to the war itself. I think we've characterized the inner war years pretty well. So take us through, you know, we don't need the, the full class on it, but take us through why the Mexican-American War happened. Just kind of a brief overview of it. San Francisco Harbor. That's why it happens. The, now, we could, that's the, the specific aim point for right. the Polk administration. That I believe he says something like, it's worth 100 Texases. Mm-hmm. Right? It's the gateway to Eastern trade. Um, so that's really what, what Polk, is, his design is after. Um, but we could draw, tie in Manifest Destiny, the sense of uh, the American people need to advance for cultural and religious p- reasons across the continent. Uh, uh, the Texas question comes into play when, when uh, you have the, the Texas Rebellion in 1835 and they become their own country for a while. Uh, and when the U.S. annexes Texas, it inherits the dispute over the Nueces Strip. Mm-hmm. Look on a map, basically it's the strip of land north of the Rio Grande. There's a disagreement of basically what land was inherited with the Texas Republic claims. Right. And that becomes really the, the cause for war is dispute over that specific territory. Mm-hmm. And with that, additional war aims will come into play. So what is the Polk administration's goal in the war beyond just getting a very good harbor on the west coast what's what are they what are they you know if we were sitting down and drawing out the combatant commander task list what would mm-hmm. what would polk want out of this war for they want mexico to cede the territory and accept payment okay what territory specifically? uh really uh we're talking about all the the southwest states from texas uh you know through nevada on to california mm-hmm. uh <clears throat> and he tries to buy it before the war. Of course, Mexico says no. They have their you know, their regular folks with pride in their their land and their history. Uh, so, you know, does Polk provoke the war? Probably so. But Mexico is also sending armies north, so it's kind of a probably a inevitable um, intersection of of destinies to see who's going to be the great the mm-hmm. dominant republic of North America. Yeah. So this is a point I'm, I'm glad you validated by teaching all those years ago. Uh, the way I always used to approach this was we tend to forget Mexico and the U.S. are about the same size physically. If I remember correctly, they have fairly similar populations, uh, although Mexico tends to be concentrated in the south, yeah. far from what is what is now the, the, the full United States. Um, and these are two of the, the few functioning republics in the mm-hmm. world in the 1840s. They're big. They have large populations that are very diverse. But they're functional states. Maybe the United States slightly more than the Mexican Republic, but still, the Mexican Republic hasn't faced its big challenges yet. They come later. So, why can't they be friends? Why why can't why can't they manage to coexist on the continent together? It's those darn Texans. They're always getting <laughs> getting in the way of history. Uh, it, it you know it's about land, and no Mexican politician can be a viable have a viable career and even hint at capitulation and selling this territory. And the Americans have this idea that everything in front of, their, in front of them is theirs. Mm-hmm. Theirs for the taking. And there's a lot of people that already live there. Mm-hmm. Um, and f- if we want to just, I guess, get to the practical aspect, that whole northern half of Mexico is, is we would say, underdeveloped uh, with both population centers and industry. And in kind of the rules of the time, it's there for the taking. Mm-hmm. Okay, so... As you mentioned, this army is um, 
professional-ish at best. <laughs> so Polk comes to office. He has this very clear, what he believes to be a mandate from the American people to take this land and other land, but we don't need to talk about that. Um, so how does he how does he get us from, you know, Captain Nance out on the frontier to I have a functional army that I'm going to send under Zachary Taylor to Texas and eventually John C. Fremont out west? Yeah, so he commits uh, really to a two-pronged effort initially, and that's he sends an army of, quote, observation mm -hmm. straight down into the Nueces Strip, mm -hmm. uh, really what we, to Corpus Christi, which is um, just a giant screw you to the Mexicans. They respond, send their army of the north, and just kind of the, at that point, friction's inevitable. At the same time, they send the Navy around South America, up up to uh, the Pacific coast. And also from where we sit now, Fort Leavenworth, they send a, cow, a dragoon expedition uh, straight west. Uh, and this is design, this, uh, designed to, to basically take California rather quickly. There's actually a militia rebel, a small re militia rebellion there um, that will unite with these kind of American uh, multi-pronged efforts, and so that's that's the idea. Is mm -hmm. the issue is going to be decided by battle? Now, are these regular uh, comprised mostly of regular army forces, or are they supplemented by state in, forces? Initially, in this initial campaign, it's almost all regular army because it takes time to mobilize, mm -hmm. and they're going to have an interesting mobilization system where the states provide volunteer regiments mm -hmm. that then the federal army gets to take charge of. But each state, different states will have different service agreements. And so you'll have, I believe, you know, during the middle of campaigns, entire state volunteer regiments say, yep, we're done. Yep. Let's go home. Yep. And that's a that's a difficult thing for the operational artist to manage. Um, no stop loss. <laughs> so initially, that's that's the idea. We And it, and it goes actually pretty well. They did a, a series of victories along the Rio Grande. Okay, we, we've protected the gains in Texas. After some setbacks in California, they do get the win there mm -hmm. uh, very quickly. Although there will be, if I remember correctly, a native Californios uprising against the Americans. Yeah, there is. There's also uh, native. Uh, there's also Mexican citizens joining the Americans. Right. Politics yeah, are complicated. It's a, it's a messy thing. I there's think. also a mini uprising in uh, Santa Fe, mm -hmm. where some bad things happen. But. By you know, by the end of eighteen forty six, they're getting their hands around it, mm -hmm. and at this point, the Mexicans should come to the table mm -hmm. and agree to to their they're still, I guess, in a okay bargaining position because um, they do have a larger army and they could, they are, they are mobilizing their larger conscript army, um, but of course, you know, they have pride. Their their politicians can't offer this, and the war kind of enters a stalemate until Santa Ana will march uh, a counteroffensive north, and we end up with a clash at Buena Vista up near the Rio Grande, and the war should be over at that point. So before we, before we move past Buena Vista, I do want to talk about it at least a little bit, because this is kind of, the, for one, it's going to put Zachary Taylor in the White House, um, but, but also it's, I think it's illustrative of what you are talking about earlier, where you have these two armies, you mentioned the Mexican one is bigger, it's older, right, because it's inherited from the Spanish colonial army. You could argue it's more professional, uh -huh. and yet it's defeated, if not soundly, effectively by this American force. So so give us kind of the 30,000-foot the view of what happened at Buena Vista. Uh, this is the, the moment for the volunteers and what we would call the National Guard to step up because Taylor is forced to divert most of his regulars over to the Gulf of Mexico for, for use by Winfield Scott in the Veracruz operation. Uh, actually, Santa Ana finds out about this, captures a messenger straight north with his, uh, with kind of like a reinforced Army of the North. Um, only it's a long trek, lots of logistical problems. They're tired when they get there. And then he attacks Taylor, who's in a defensive position with excellent artillery. And it's a tough fight, um, but Taylor's left holding the ground. Mm -hmm. And the position is untenable for Santa Ana. He's forced to retreat. By the way, he has a much larger army than Taylor, and he still is unable to take the position. Um, and by, because he retreats, he loses. So why then doesn't Taylor just march to Mexico City? Uh, that's an option, actually. Uh, first of all, they would face the same logistical problems Santa Ana did, but it's still a viable course of action until uh, maybe Polk realizes Taylor's a Whig. 
Yeah. And he's already got this string of victories. Uh, the twin victories on the Rio Grande. He takes one of the most imposing fortresses in America at Monterey by storm. Now he's won at Buena Vista. He is the hero of the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, Not as well thought of across the army by some people. Uh, And and so, uh, you know, Polk cannot give him more political... Uh, more political bounds for upcoming elections. Okay, so enter Winfield Scott. Uh, What what role has he played up until this point? So he's been managing support for the war effort from D.C., kind of making sure, you know, they uh, really, if you can imagine, down to the Rio Grande Theater, you have two uh, supply lines, one coming down the Mississippi, one coming down the East Coast from Philadelphia, where most of the military, both the Army and the Navy stores are. And so he's mobilizing... Uh, the material required, but also uh, the volunteer regiments, which are going to come from nearly every state. So is he is he kind of working like a one man Pentagon? Basically, there is no general staff to speak of in D.C. Um, the you know the, the American Army is very small. They don't require something like the Prussians or the French uh, what they will develop. So he's working studiously on that with with the War Department um, until it turns out. You know, Taylor's going to be stalled for a variety of reasons. Polk needs to open up another front. It's uh, both the Navy and the Army suggest it to him. Mm-hmm. Let's go through Veracruz. Let's follow Cortez's route, and we can end this thing. He tries a couple schemes to place uh, political Democrats over the Army to lead the campaign. They don't work, again, because uh, Scott has allies in Congress who kill the idea. And then he, uh, Polk is grudgingly has to turn to the remaining kind of senior commander. Mm -hmm. And so Scott goes from being kind of the institutional commander to an operational commander overnight. Now, something I want to hold I want to grab on you just real quick before we leave this point. You said the Department of the Navy and the Department and the War Department, which for we're not familiar for those that aren't familiar with there was no Department of Defense where they both fit under. So the Army and the Navy are both cabinet level positions reporting to the president. Yeah. So is uh, Winfield Scott already cooperating well, the, with the, the Navy. Well, there's a war secretary. Okay. And Scott's reporting through him, but he also sometimes yeah. has access to the president. Yeah. Uh, so on that note, is Winfield Scott already cooperating with the Navy at this, na- uh, before he's even left D.C. Yeah. or its environs, is he already starting to think jointly? They, they've already started uh, the Naval support for the Rio Grande Theater. And there's been Naval... Uh, cooperation off of California where they have to join forces for some land battles. Um, the Navy's starting to expand their kind of harassment of Mexican ports up and down the Gulf, but also over in the Baja Peninsula and up and down California, Upper California. So the cooperation's starting there, and that's going to be a good foundation to build on for Veracruz. So what does this cooperation look like? Because is, there is no DOD, so this yeah. is no all, joint doctrine. There, there is no joint doctrine. So is this President Polk making everyone sit down in a room? Is this uh, Winfield Scott having a good idea? How does this work? Yeah, I think it's the, the secretaries, the cabinet officials working with these senior, the senior general, the senior admiral. There is a, a guy named Jessup is the senior quartermaster for the Army. So it's a, an ad hoc, I would say, system, but they're making it work. So this is personality-based but playing nice. If yeah, I'm, absolutely. Is that, is that a correct yeah, I, I'd say so. And we see that in California later on, because of personalities, they do not play nice. And mm-hmm. it, the joint cooperation becomes a problem. So one of the things that we often encounter in military history, particularly in American military history, is service rivalries, sometimes to the point of uh, sabotaging operations. In fact, we mentioned the War of 1812. It happens a lot. So how does Scott fit into this tradition of kind of uh, U.S. Army service chauvinism, where he just wants Army to do Army things and he despises the Navy. Is that, that's kind of the tradition, but what's his attitude towards that? Yeah, I don't, I don't have the evidence of his pre-war, uh, any, any kind of animosity towards the Navy. Naturally, there's, they're competing for share of budget. They have different traditions, but mostly they've operated in different separate domains. Yeah. Um, so it hasn't, you know, I don't think they've had as much friction as maybe the the, the, the Royal Navy and the, the British Army, maybe. perhaps. Um, but definitely, you know, they're looking at who's going to be in the newspapers after the war 
who wants the, the who's going to get credit for the glory. So there's a natural tendency to box out the other service uh, when possible. Um, so for, for Scott, though, that's one of the things that makes him remarkable is he works very well with the Navy throughout the war. Why do you think that is? Where do you think that comes from? Uh, I think part of it is, uh, frankly, the Commodore, who is the home fleet commander. So he's, he's in charge of all naval forces on, off of the Atlantic coast. Um, I think he accepts that he does have a supporting role. But Scott also sets the conditions. The letter he writes to Com- Commodore Connor initially is... Uh, it's very generous in asking for support and saying we're going to work together. He uses the word joint um, and makes it clear that this is a partnership mm-hmm. from the first letter. And then they work together. So, uh, Scott, I give him credit for making some key decisions, for instance, a joint reconnaissance of the Veracruz fortifications and then changing the plan to allow Navy to have more, really more control of the landings. So, I want to dwell on this point for just one more um question to both of you, having both been on the ground in combat areas, uh, why is this so important? This idea of somebody who's willing to reach out to another service, another branch, uh, somebody who's different, and include them rather than dominate them. I could say it's extremely important in 1847 because there's no doctrine. And there's almost no precedent for for the U.S. military of something of this scale, this expeditionary. So it's based off personalities working together and problem solving together, f- you know, forward on in, in the uh, operational environment. So that's that's what makes this this uh, interesting and, and unique and explains a lot of the success is that they were both open to a partnership. Um, also, if I want to read into some of Scott's psychology, he, he is the dominating figure of the era, so he's probably quite secure in sharing yeah. the glory versus perhaps, you know, another U.S. Army general like Zachary Taylor, you might not get the same vibe. Okay. So let's take this because uh, on this because the, the key thing is, like, they just know things that you don't. Uh, is it, for instance, like, well, well, why can't I land there? It's like, well, because the currents are wrong. I'm, I, or, yeah. there's uh, a, or there's a reef. It, or, you know, pl- it turns out that, you know, you can't, put like five M1s on a C-17, <laughs> right? Uh, the, the simple things that you just don't know because you're very, very good at your job, but you have, but there, there's, there are other components of this and where the sea meets the shore, that's one of those where the Navy's very, very good at their end, mm-hmm. but the Army is also very, very good at their end, but there's a seam where they have to kind of ask each other what's the right answer. And to me, it's, it's fascinating as you're describing it. It's like the guys that are able to set their egos aside and say, I'm not the smartest man in the room. Yeah. Uh, I remember you were talking a little bit about this you, when they were doing the landing itself. Can you talk through that a little bit where, where they're actually doing the joint landing and how Scott basically says, no, I, my guys need to step out of the way? Yeah, yeah. So, um, and by the way, let me back up a little bit and say that one of the ironies of Scott, I think, is that he has feuds with everybody. His his nickname, Old Fuss and Feathers, is well earned. He's he's kind of a jerk, uh, to be honest. And you know, other U.S. Army generals, he has feuds with almost every one of them. Most presidents don't like him. Uh, and it's so the irony is that he gets along great with these Commodores. Um, for some reason, he's able to turn on the charm, or I don't know, maybe they're jerks too, and they they like each other. I don't know, but. Um, he makes it work in Veracruz. Yeah. Uh, so one of the interesting things is the Army owns the transport ships. The Army owns the landing craft. And so the original plan, Scott is going to control all of that, the, the landing and everything. So we would now call that the landing force commander? Yeah, and he would, he would be in charge of it. And after they do the reconnaissance, after they do their collaborative planning, he cedes that to the Navy. He lets the Navy have control of everything until the, the, for, the Army forces are on the, the beach. Shout out to the uh, U.S. Army 6th Infantry Regiment, first to put their flag on the beach. So uh, a piece that may confuse <laughs> modern listeners is, where is the Marine Corps? Uh, so the Marine Corps is mostly a ship detachment-based force up into the Mexican War. Um, and during the war, they will form an infantry regiment in March on Mexico City with Scott. At the assault on Veracruz, I believe there's only one company of Marines present. They'll go. They'll, they'll help out. They'll be there. Um, you know, but the halls of Montezuma is going to come with a reinforcement regiment that will follow Scott and join him for the, 
the main fight at, at Mexico City. So when you talk about it, he's like, as Scott says, hey, Navy, you can handle this. Yep. Well, if he's got the ships and he has the boats, why doesn't he just run Well, it? part of this becomes technical. The The landing site chosen is about two and a half miles south of Veracruz. It's a, a nice, you know, gentle beach. Um it, there's a it's kind of there's an island nearby in in the slot between the beach and the island there's not much space there's not enough space for all the ships of the line with the guns and all the transports so uh, Connor the the commodore he recommends well let's let's move all the men from the transports to the ships of the line so there's fewer will will and some of these are sail some are steam we'll move these ships in uh, and then go from these combat ships to the landing craft, which are about, uh, Scott special orders holds about 40 men per landing craft. The Navy will man these. Um, and so as that plan develops, just makes sense to Scott. Well, you can just have control of the landing. Right. And so he had a complicated series of signals and everything developed. And he just says, well, we'll just let the Navy handle it. Yeah. Which in some ways makes sense because it's, it's an easy win, right? It's not a contested landing. Yeah. As you mentioned, which they don't know it's not going to be contested. Uh, and and we're miles from Veracruz, although within proximity of assaulting it. So in some ways, and like you say, it, it kind of does make sense. Yep. So okay, we've landed. Well, and there's one other joint aspect that's interesting. As the landing's happening, Scott. So the, the it's about 200 ships in the Armada, and um, one of the interesting aspects of the naval uh, war here is that the big ships are less useful. Mm -hmm. uh, they need smaller gunboats, surf ships that can go up. A lot of the Mexican ports are kind of up rivers um, or there's reefs or it's just difficult to get in range. So a lot of this fleet is actually gunboats. And what they will do, they will sail up and provide covering fire because there is some Mexican cavalry overlooking the beach. And they're, so we're going to see this, even though it's not, um, you know, it's, I would say, not absolutely necessary. They're, they're providing covering naval covering fire for the army landing at the beach. It's coordinated. And so that's a, an interesting aspect of, you know, it's foreshadowing a lot of the cooperation in World War II. Oh, yeah, for sure. Okay, so Veracruz, is a, it's a coastal city. It's a coastal fortress. Yeah. Scott has his landing party ashore, thanks to the Navy. Uh, now what? So Scott has two options. He can lay siege to the city and wait this out with a cannonade. Or he can assault the city mm -hmm. and and end it quickly. And a lot of his officers actually want to do the latter. They want to go, you know, go get it done. And even Scott writes about this, how, like, back home, the American people will see it as more of a glorious fight if he loses more guys right. and still wins versus his approach. He, he opts for uh, the less costly approach, and he, he's going to move the army to encircle the city from the landward side, cut off all the roads to Mexico City and he's going to set it, dig in to commence a bombardment and hopefully force a surrender without an assault. And this isn't that, um, I mean, obviously he wants to limit loss of life on his side, but he has to save this combat power for, for the actual phase that matters and that's the march on Mexico City. He knows Santa Ana is raising another army and he expects somewhere between Veracruz and Mexico City he'll, he'll fight a, a set piece battle and that should decide the war. He doesn't even think he'll necessarily have to occupy the capital. Mm -hmm. um, he will have to. Then he'll have to occupy Mexico for a year. So the Mexican, he he doesn't fully understand just how um, resistant the Mexicans are. So another peek into his psychology here. Do you think this is the product of good planning? Or do you think he's kind of imagining the campaign to be what he wants it to be? No, one of Scott's uh, positive attributes, he is an excellent planner. He writes kind of what we'd call a point paper back in D.C. when they're, President Polk is dreaming up this idea. Well, yeah, maybe maybe a, a, a Veracruz operation. He writes what is really almost a design paper, taking apart the weaknesses and approaches to the fortress. He understands Mexican society, what one of the things he'll do later that kind of forecasts our modern counterinsurgency doctrine is he'll... He'll uh, discover wedge issues between the Mexican peasantry, the church, mm -hmm. the aristocrats, the general officer corps, and he'll start to exploit that. And indeed, the resistance will mostly just be a, an elite affair. The Mex the folks are going to sit out the, the resistance to the American occupation, by and large. 
Um, but yeah, he, he plans this. He's thinking ahead. And a lot of this is he's well read. Mm -hmm. He travels with a small library. Um, he's, uh, you know, he reads obviously French. Uh, I don't know of any other languages. So he's able to read a lot of the texts that have been coming out of the the long Napoleonic Wars. Yeah. Um, so I would attribute this. He's, he's a planner. Okay. So as he's fight, so he's getting ready for a siege. Well, that's going to require a lot of stuff, and it's going to require, require some time. And of course, armies need ports because that's how you. That is the most efficient way to offload a ship as a port. Yep. Well, the only port in the area is in bad guy hands. Yep. So that means he is going to require not only the Navy to supply him, because he would need that anyways. Yep. But can you talk a minute about what the ship-to-shore logistics looks like as he's putting this together, and how does that work into his joint planning? Yeah, so they, they create a giant supply dump on the original landing beach south of the city. Uh, but what he really needs for a campaign is the deep water harbor of Veracruz. Um, so he's got to take the city. He manages to isolate it, encircle it maintains a naval blockade on the other side. And one of his uh, his problems is firepower. A lot of the Army's cannon don't show up. They're pretty small field cannon anyways, as you would imagine a maneuvering field army would have at that time. And so, again, in another act, act of joint cooperation, he's going to uh, work, basically ask, I don't know if they offer, he asks, but six large cannon from the ships will be moved onto the land, and they're going to set up a naval land battery right next to the Army batteries. Which is what happened at the Battle of New Orleans under Andrew Jackson. Sure, sure. So this this unprecedent there. Um, so on the ship to shore, is this the yeah. Navy handling all the ship to shore stuff? Like he's kind of ceded all of that to them. Even yeah, it's a has... it's a cooperation. He has his quartermasters involved. Um, okay. And by the way, there's some interruptions because of storms mm -hmm. where they're running low on supplies, but then the storm goes away and they got to rush. So some real real world friction intervenes. Mm -hmm. There's also uh, attempts at uh, relief parties. From the interior that have to be deflected, so it's a siege line that's pointed both ways. Yeah, Caesar, uh, Caesar and Alicia, yeah. and Alicia, um, and they know they're on the clock. A because of uh, the sickness will set in the yellow fever season, but also they know Santa Ana's forming another army that has that's going to have to be dealt with. So you got an army full of engineers, you got Navy helping you. You're staring at these fortress walls. How does the siege of Veracruz end? Uh, he offers, uh, you know, sends an emissary asking for surrender. The Mexicans say no, of course. So he commences a four-day uh, bombardment from sea and land, uh, a lot focused on destroying the interior of the city. So some terror fires here. Um, they, do, they do knock down some of the fortifications, uh, but he's still resistant to, to exploiting that with an assault, and eventually the Mexicans do surrender. So, uh, Colonel Lance, retired real quick. Uh, if you are facing an entrenched enemy behind dense fortifications, we're, so we're talking meters thick rebar, what kind of uh, what kind of ratio do you need to be able to effectively assault that? We're talking a normal attack. We say three to one, uh, yeah. and then now that there's a lot of well actuallys that go into that. Uh, so understand that that is a that's a starting point number. S Scott has about that. He has about eleven thousand yeah. soldiers. There's about four thousand defenders, fifteen thousand civilians, um, and I think he thinks he could do it. It's just that. So that's the cost. Yeah. normally, but uh, yeah. but but if you're in a but if you're in a uh, entrenched position like yeah. that in a city, you're talking five. You want as there really isn't an upward limit, if that makes sense. Yeah. You want uh, you want as you want the odds as far in your favor as you possibly can swing it. Yeah. So Scott here is not he's not being a coward. He's he's doing the math right. I think it's fair to say doing the math, and again uh, forecasting what's to come. He right. needs a viable army to march on the capital. Okay. So we, we're bombarding Veracruz. Uh, civilians are dying. May, you know, it's hard to say exactly how many. Somewhere between three hundred and a thousand. Um, a lot of fires, a lot of buildings coming down. Um, and so it, it's devastating. There's an interesting um, moment where during the bombardment, an emissary from the city comes out and asks that all the foreigners be allowed to leave. Like the, there's a whole bunch of ambassadors and their families. And Scott says no. Mm -hmm. He says no to civilians leaving. He bottles up the city. And he, what he's doing is placing additional pressure on that Mexican garrison commander to, to is call there, you, you mentioned that he's a planner, right? Yeah. So... Is there any fact of the matter of he doesn't actually want to destroy the fortifications because he's going to need them? 
Uh, I, I I saw no. He I, 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 he did not express that, but that could be it. Mm-hmm. He obviously uh, that's going to be uh, the entry point into Central Mexico, and it's going to have to be protected. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's planning to win in the field. So you guys have both done staff planning uh, at both low and and at least medium to high level. Is Scott unusual here in taking social and political considerations into account, like you said, leaving the, the, the diplomats in the city, or is this something unique to him? Uh, I think this is somewhat unique to him, uh, in part because he, again, he's studying history, as Dr. Nance said. <laughs> he's studied the French experience in Spain in yeah. the Peninsula War. He studied, he, we know for a fact he has uh, three volumes set, and he knows that uh, this is, by the way, why he's going to charm the Catholic Church in Mexico. He mm-hmm. does. He saw what happened with the Catholic cler- the clergy and how they roused the population against the French. Uh, he he cannot afford a general uprising. He has a, you know, basically an eleven thousand man army occupying an area with something like four to six million people. Mm-hmm. So he has to keep the folks uh, out of the game and on the bench. And you see this as late as the Civil War, right? The the Anaconda Plan which is the, the encirclement of the Confederacy, cutting them off at the, yep. with the waterways and then slowly crushing inward. Everyone laughs at him in 1860 and 1861, and that's... Joke's on them. He's right. <laughs> yeah, and it turns out that that's actually yeah. Yeah. the way to do it. Now, there, there's some detail work in there, obviously. but Yeah, yeah I believe he advises against Bull Run. Explicitly, yeah. which makes sense. It's, <laughs> yeah, it seems it seems fair to say that he's somebody who has a strategic level view, kind of from the beginning of this yeah. conflict. Okay, so Veracruz surrenders. Veracruz surrenders. Uh, this is another interesting joint anecdote comes into play. So there's an, uh, some initial ta- negotiations talks at how this is going to work. He selects one of his, his division commanders and then brings in a navy captain. He asks the commodore, "Give me a captain," and together they conduct the negotiation. Mm-hmm. And then further, at the signing of the surrender, now, now it's Scott, Scott's moment to sit at the table, he brings in the Commodore, and they sign the document together. So a real, you know, again, maintaining that partnership. Right. He writes back to the Secretary of War in Washington, giving praise to the Navy, how, they've, how, how much assistance they've provided. So um, a guy who's, you know, rather prickly, he's showing a, a generous side here. Okay. So now, uh, as Dr. Nance was talking about earlier, we, we have fixed our ship-to-shore logistics problem. We have an entrepot into the country. Um, this is where many invasions fall apart, amphibious right. invasions. We have our bridgehead. Where do we go from here? Uh, go west, young man. He's, he's going to just leave a small garrison in the city. He's going to be utterly reliant on joint uh, logistics. So... Uh, sea lines of operation all the way back to New Orleans, up to Philly, up to Mississippi. Um, And he's just going to have to trust this Commodore is going to maintain the throughput of supplies. Um, And then he's just going to march. He's going to march and force a decisive battle at a place called Cerro Gordo. Um, He will win it decisively. Basically, the Santa Ana puts together another army. He's going to adopt a defensive position on that road, the, the road to Mexico City. So Santa Ana is, seems like he's learning from Buena Vista. Seems like, yeah. Uh, actually adopting uh, Taylor's uh, position, except um, Taylor was smarter with terrain. Taylor knew it was very difficult to outflank him at Buena Vista. And so Scott will move up, and his trusty engineer captain, Robert Lee, will actually lead a reconnaissance through this rough brush terrain that... Santa Ana thinks an army can't march through, and he'll find the pathway. He'll go back and report to Scott, and then so Scott will launch a devastating flanking attack on this otherwise strong position and win the day. Okay, so we've now won our culminating battle. Does this end the campaign the way Scott envisioned? No, Mexicans refuse to come to the table. At this point... Showing yeah, they've deserted him. They, <laughs> they've lost on every front. He, yeah, he's followed the rules of war, and, and yeah. the rules just aren't working. Um, and so that instead, Santa Ana uh, recoups another army and establishes a, a fortified defense around Mexico City. So Scott is forced to march on the capital. Um, this is going to be a series of assaults where the Americans will win every time, and then they'll seize the city. The Mexican leadership, they'll, they'll sack Santa Ana at this point, and they will abscond to a town nearby. Interesting, uh, Scott does not send 
an expedition to take them out. He needs someone to, to work with. Right. Because um, if you if you kill the leadership, then who's going to surrender? Right. And so, by the way, he's now checking off all of the cog analysis from Napoleon. Right. I've defeated their army in the field. Mm -hmm. I've taken their capital. Negotiations should commence. Right. Um, and they just don't. Right. And so he, the U.S. Army will have to occupy greater Mexico for a year before the Mexicans uh, decide to sell their half of their country for less than half the price offered before the war. So at this point, he's transitioned into what we would now call stability operations from his conventional campaign to defeat the enemy forces. Uh, so how, how does he approach this and how does he compare to other Americans who've been put in the situation? Yeah, I, th I think he, uh, you know, has a nuanced approach and really a lot of parallels with kind of the growing kind of the growing pains of the US Army and the coin wars of late. Um, so for example, every town on the march to Mexico, Mexico City they occupy, he issues a proclamation uh, to all the citizens that he's there as to help them not to stay. He's, you know, their own elites have done this to him and maybe they're not buying that but there's a lot of animosity at that time the army the government had tried to tax the church to pay for the wars so guess what he has a rule for all of his men they're not allowed to interrupt catholic services and indeed they attend catholic services Interesting. hat in hand which is which is uh, not something you normally see in early america which is a protestant, protestant army yeah. right and so he's recognizing these what these these kind of pressure points wedge issues uh, another another wonderful thing he does is, uh, as far as effectiveness, he doesn't bring a large supply chain uh, train behind him. There's not much to bring. Instead, he brings chests of gold. So every and he has a rule: no theft, no rape, no pillaging. Not always enforced, especially by the volunteer uh, soldiers. But by and large, he enters a city, and the market flourishes. And he's buying from ranchers and farmers. Food, food and livestock for the army, uh, and that goes a long way in preventing, uh, you know, again, the peasantry from joining the uprising. So, again, Captain Nance, uh, you have been marching your platoon around in a square for a long time, or your company. Uh, now you're on occupation duty, and I ask you this specifically because you have been on stability duty before <laughs> in uh, U.S. Army uniform. So this is not the war you wanted, but it's the war you have. So how would you rate Scott's approach? Superb. I mean... Uh, he has the advantage. It's it's always nice to go in behind someone who's less liked. Uh, <laughs> so if uh, so, as a, for instance, if Santa Ana is doing bad things with the Catholic Church, all you have to do is not that. <laughs> if you are, if your soldiers are requisitioning stuff from the peasantry, mm -hmm. all you have to do is pay. Mm -hmm. And so he's got the so he uh, so he is able to take advantage of the circumstance. But what I find interesting, what uh, Colonel Jennings has pointed out, is is that Scott's smart enough to tell the difference and, and to do something about it, and that act, and uh, he's doing really, really well there because he's able to turn that from a potentially hostile populace to at least a neutral populace. Yeah. Uh, what he needs is apathy. He knows they're never going to welcome him and love him. Right. He just needs them not to pick up arms. Okay, so he wins the war, not by himself, with lots of help, particularly from the Navy, but he, is, he and Taylor are the victors. And there's, there's a long story after this with, with Winfield Scott and his political career. Uh, but, but I want to return back to the way you characterized him at the beginning. You said, you said essentially he was the most effective commander in American history. Yeah. Based on what we've talked about, why? So historians love absolute statements because they yes. can be knocked down, of course. <laughs> this is what, something I do in the classroom. Uh, so I, I look at it in terms of resource investment mm -hmm. for strategic gains. I don't know of a, a campaign where with so f such a small army, such a relatively low cost, you know, he doubles the size of the country. Mm -hmm. um, set, you know, and he, as just a... a fellow officer, I one thing I can admire is he wins. He's a pentathlete. He mm -hmm. wins in such a variety of circumstances. Amphibious warfare, set-piece battle, fortifications, counter-guerrilla warfare. He does it all. And, and, he, and he's successful. Yeah. Well, so the question for both of you, and we'll start with, uh, we'll start with Dr. Nance, we'll wrap with Colonel Jennings. Uh, I can imagine 
a civilian or even a, a U.S. military officer listening to this and saying, I'll never be that. I'll never be a pentathlete. So what do you think we should learn from, from Scott here? Again, Dr. Nance, we'll start with you. I like the fact that Scott knew how to work with others. And it's amazing what you can do when you realize that you're not the smartest person in the room and you can ask for and receive help. It, it, it turns out that no, you, you don't have to be the fastest guy in the room. You just have to be able to find that person and use that person effectively. And that's how you win all those things. He doesn't do all those things because he's the best at all of them. He does them because he finds people that can help him get to that. And I think that's uh, that's the lesson that I would pull from Scott and that I would hope that field grades or cadets pick up from Scott. Okay. Yeah, I'd offer... Uh, two accounts one uh study of history right that's is a reason every pme institution in the U, in the u.s military has a history department or section uh because you know you can learn vicariously through those experiences and he does that i really think his his policies of the occupation are directly come from his study of the the horrible French experience in Spain, mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. Like it it pays it pays dividends. It saves resources, lives, and brings in efficiencies. The second, uh, I would argue, he's one of the architects of the American way of war. Mm -hmm. So he's ahead of his time. This expeditionary campaign, uh, basically not intercontinental in his case, but you know requires a sea lock to get there. So he's. He's, an, he's a, a forerunner of this idea that the Army, the Navy, the Marines, the Air Force have to work together to achieve strategic aims in any campaign conceivable. Uh, he, and so he shows the way as really as a joint force commander on how to make that happen. All right, very good. Winfield Scott, first American joint force commander. Colonel Jennings, thanks for joining us. Thank you. If you like this episode, please make sure to check out our other podcast, Broad Gauge Gossips where we talk to members of the Department of Military History faculty so you can get to know them.